I'm Beth Whitworth, race car driving, quilt making, CPA firm owning, wife, mom, and boss. I'm here to help you build a business you love by sharing all of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the excellent sides of working in this industry. It's not always easy, but after many years, I can finally say it's worth it. Let me guide you on your journey to accounting with confidence. Hello, and welcome to Accounting with Confidence podcast. I am Beth Whitworth, your host. And today I want to talk to you about Colby A and accountants. So Colby, which is spelled K-O-L-B-E, is a system for measuring how you instinctively take action. So I know that sounds super complicated, and I kind of need to backtrack a little bit and tell you why I want to talk about this. So I've been in business for a while, and right now I have what I would consider the dream team. I have a bunch of people on my team, a bunch, okay, maybe six, but I took the time at some point to do some assessments, kind of like personality tests type of things. And some of it was when I was going through a course that part of it was to kind of evaluate your team. And so I found a few assessments that would prove valuable to my firm. And one of them that came up was one that I had had some experience with way, way back in the day. When I say back in the day, it was about 2007. And I revisited it recently, like in the last couple of years, and just really wanted to share my results. So back to what is Colby. Colby A index is, like I said, it's a system for measuring how you instinctively take action. And this was developed by Kathy Colby back in the 70s and 80s. And initially, they developed a system that they were using to test how children actually are learning how to solve problems and how the kids naturally solved problems. So it then developed into a business tool and a leadership type of tool in order to kind of figure out how you best fit with different types of jobs, what motivates you as far as what helps you be more productive. And it definitely is a place where leadership can be assessed and kind of determining how you fit in. How did your team fit together? So the detailed part of this, is the more kind of the, the nitty gritty of it, is that the Colby A index assessment actually is something that addresses the th- three different parts of the mind. And they define those three different parts as the cognitive part, which is the thinking, the connotative part, which is the doing, and the effective part, which is the feeling. And there's other assessments that kind of, you know, touch on all of these things or have different words that identify that. But that's how the Colby A actually looks at things. It looks at the the thinking, the doing, and the feeling and put some formal names to that, the cognitive, the connotative, and the effective. So I am just say right here, I am not an affiliate with Colby at all, although I believe there's a way that I could be. I am not. I just find this tool fascinating in how it relates to me defining and really getting some insight into how my team problem solves and the similarities they have. That's that's what I'm going to be sharing with you is that I maybe have unlocked the key to finding really good people to work in accounting firms because guess what? They have some similar traits. So inside this index, this Colby A index, there are areas that get ranked and they get ranked on a scale of one to 10. And those areas are fact finder, which is how you gather and share information with other people. The second area is follow through, which is how you organize. (laughs) Yeah. And the third one is quick start, which is how you deal with risks and uncertainty. And the fourth one is implementer. 
And that is how you handle space and tangibles. And so initially, I, like I said, I was introduced to this back in 2007 when my partner that I had a firm with, she actually had a friend who was a coach in this particular type of assessment. And she helped business owners kind of identify all of these things on how their team worked together. And believe me, for me, it felt very, very woo woo. <laughs> you know, it was a foreign thing to me to actually be really looking into how people think. I mean, I'm a critical thinking accountant and we're all kind of trained, you know, this is just how you do it. It's a little black and white. We are a little, I would say, linear sometimes, I think is what how accountants could be captured and stereotyped. But one of those things where I'm like, okay, let's just do it. You know, we'll assess the team, see where we are. And in 2007, this was the first time I was ever assessed in this Colby A index. And to say the least, I was floored. So the, my results were spot on. And it sort of freaked me out. It was one of those things where I thought something was was wrong with me because I didn't score high in certain areas you would expect, and I scored really high in other areas. And once it was explained to me that how how my scores were essentially how they were interpreted is that it was really identifying entrepreneurial tendencies that I have. And those tendencies are sort of counterintuitive to what makes a strong accountant. So I'm one of those anomaly people who is not necessarily your typical problem solver in accounting. I solve problems, believe me, <laughs> but I don't necessarily do it in the same way as a lot of accountants. And that has been shown by what I've done over the years in being my own boss and being in business and just doing a variety of things that not everybody has those tendencies. So I shelved that. I shelved it for years. I had a partnership break up. It's been you know, a number of years. And then when my team started to take shape into what I have now, which is what I consider a rock star team, I brought it back because I wanted to see where everybody fit into this spectrum. And I got curious. So these results, they actually put a number to each of these four areas that I said one to 10. And Fact Finder is, you know, the, like I said, it's how you gather and share information. Well, accountants are typically very high in this area because this is this is the research, this is the detail, this is the things that are expected inside of an accountant's brain. And so this is a red bar on this graph that they present to you once you finish the assessment. And for most people in this area, you're looking at, you know, definitely a six or above for a fact finder on an accounting or very detail oriented type of profession. So just for reference, when I took this test, this was in, I think it was in 21 that I finally retested everybody, including myself. My score on the fact finder was a six. So I was just kind of over that line of what would be typical for people in this type of profession. The second area of follow through, that is how you organize things. And this is the process and systems type people. This is the thing that tells you, you know, do you actually create systems or do you just follow systems? You know, what is it that that you do in this area? And on the Colby, this is the blue bar. Now, <laughs> the, the explanation that is given for my follow through score is that my best way of organizing is to maintain. And that means I'm probably not creating the system, but I can follow it. And this is actually, again, not typical inside of what you consider the accountant's brain. I think most accounting people, they have high on fact finder, they're high, you know, at explaining, you know, getting that detail on reports and whatnot, that would be high. 
follow through would be high because most accountants like processes, like to make sure they're following processes and creating processes to handle all the things they're doing in a day. Well, mine was a four. And I remember back in 2007 that if it was a four, that was as high as it was. It was, it might have been a three. I don't remember, but I do know that my partner's was like an eight out of 10. She was a process person. I was not. So I didn't have a lot of follow through. And this assessment actually gave me some clarity into where I was struggling and why I was struggling because I wasn't the person that created all the process. I wasn't the one who finished. I could get ideas. Boy, I had the ideas, but I didn't always, I, could, I couldn't put the whole thing in place. I, I could have the idea and my biggest success is when that idea could be brought to fruition with someone else's help on the process side. So that's where I was on the follow through. Now, the third was the quick start. And this is how you deal with risks and uncertainty. And this is the thing that gave me my light bulb moment of why I'm different. And that's because my quick start, which is the green bar on the graph that you're given, is a seven. Now, that typically accountants are not considered (laughs) risk takers, but mine showed that definitely I am. And that's how I got to be an entrepreneur. That's how I got to the point of, I will try new things. I am not afraid necessarily of change. (laughs) And let me tell you, that is, that's not typical. So I would say that this is probably very typical inside of people who are serial entrepreneurs, but in the accountant, it is not necessarily something that actually you see very much of, because this is how do you handle risk? And the fourth area, that implementer area, that's a yellow bar on the graph, and that's how you handle space and tangibles. And mine was a three. That just really tells you (laughs) I'm not one to be working with my hands. I'm I'm not going to create a a model of something with my hands. I'm going to envision things more rather than actually create things inside my space. And I think high levels of implementers are probably, you're looking at your your builders and creators and people who are actually making things, changing things inside their spaces. I'm not there. So those were my results. So they, they kind of give you a number for each category and then they kind of carry that score through and give you an analysis of what that means on how you work. And so As a reminder, my results were a six for fact finder, four for follow through, seven for quick start, and three for implementer. So seven was my highest. That was on the risk taker. Now, when you get into this report, after you've taken the the test, it gives you even more detail on each of these areas. And it's once you get over a six in something, that is, that's kind of how they really delineate. That's, that's how you problem solve. That is your go-to on your problem solving method. Um, and it's funny when they say things in, in, relating to your quick start, you know, mine was a seven and they use the words innovate and things like you will experiment to see what will happen. And they're right. Sometimes I, I absolutely do that. I am not necessarily someone who is reading the directions all the way through before I start a project. You know, I'm going to, I could probably figure this out on my own is kind of my MO. I go, I, I just try it. And that, like I said, is not typical for the accounting profession. And the reason I can kind of talk about what I feel is typical and not typical is because I tested everybody else on my team at the time. And I kind of feel like I have unlocked the key to um, what is a good bookkeeper and accountant score on this particular assessment. And I will tell you that they are, like I mentioned, they're high in fact finding and follow through and low in quick start. That's those are that's how you will know it would be somebody who's probably really good at handling 
the detail and the communication relating to doing accounting work, whether that's tax work or bookkeeping work or payroll work, reconciliations and generating reports. That is absolutely what I have found across the board on my Rockstar team members. So the good, the bad, and the ugly of it is that the high in fact finding and follow through, you know, that gives you people who tend to communicate information very specifically and they organize information by systematizing. They create systems. They create those systems for those of us who aren't strong and follow through, well, to follow. And the downside of that is that sometimes you get way more information than you need. So for me, I'm kind of a a bottom line, bullet point type communicator. And that's what I want to see as well from other people communicating. And people who are high in fact finding tend to give more than I need in communication. So I kind of feel like sometimes I'm having to dig through and determine what is the next action here. There's lots of information here, but I want the bottom line. What's the next action that needs to be taken? So the other fact on the good bookkeepers and accountants that are high in fact finding and follow through, the opposite of that is they're low in quick start. And that means they're not necessarily going to innovate. They're not going to reinvent the wheel if something is working. They're not going to look for a new solution um, without a whole bunch of research. And they may have some pushback for why things should stay the same. And this is something that I've been in the business long enough that the innovation that has happened in our industry is huge. I mean, we have gone from green ledger paper in two or three hole punched notebooks to a completely paperless environment. That did not come without a lot of kicking and screaming from a lot of people in the industry who were not really big on risk taking. So that's why it took so long, I think, for our industry to actually move into a lot of these digital era. You know, even going into keeping books on computer versus ledgers, all of that, we were not the first to do it. We were behind because I think the majority of the personalities didn't problem solve that way. They, they looked at it and said, that's, that's risky. What happens when the power goes out? What happens if the hardware breaks? What happens, you know, and where they could definitely trust and feel very little risk when it came to writing all of the information down on paper and in the ledgers. Now, believe it or not, I have one person on my team who has been with me the entire time. So Nicole has been with me since the very beginning. So she was there when we took our first round of Colby assessments back in 2007. And she's been with me and she took it again in 2021. And so what I thought would be interesting is for you to hear those results. So Nicole's a rock star. She has an accounting degree. She's been working as, you know, doing bookkeeping and tax and payroll and all of these things for me for a very long time. I mean, I think we're at, I guess, 16, 17 years. So she is one of those people who absolutely the opposite of me in a lot of ways. We get along great, love her dearly. And let me tell you the difference between her 2007 scores and her 2021 scores. So in Fact Finder, Nicole was in 2007, she was a Fact Finder of an eight, so very high in Fact Finding, a follow through of a six, so very leaning towards the top there. Her quick start for her risk taking was a two and her implementer was a three. Now to tell you a little bit about Nicole at this time, She was newly working in the accounting industry. 
She was, I believe she was not married yet, didn't have any children, um, was just working. And so she was fairly new to the industry at this point. And she stuck with me for all these years. And in 2021, when she took the assessment again, she was an eight in fact finder, which was exactly the same. Her follow through was up to an eight and from a six to an eight in 2021. Her quick start was down to a one from a two and her implementer stayed exactly the same at a three. And so I'm, I'm finding a trend on these implementer scores with a, the accountants in the group, which are, you know, we're not big hands-on type people. But what it does tell me on this is in 2021, when she retook the test, at this point in her life, Nicole had been married for a number of years. She had two children that were, I don't even remember how old they are, but they, she had had two kids. She had been working through a lot of the implementation and changes and systems that we needed to create as the firm grew and changed. And she was my right-hand person for many of those years. She was the one that, like I said, has the only person who's been with me from the beginning until now. And the fact that her follow-through jumped up a couple of points tells me that I think that was part of learning and maturing. So she really dove into the systemizing piece of the story. Now, as a reminder, my systemization, my follow-through is a four. And so it became very apparent to me that I needed someone who excelled in that follow through. That was a good compliment to me in order to make things happen inside my firm, to get the changes to happen, to have systems in place so we can start to standardize work, so that we had processes, we had procedures to follow. And that was amazing. But the thing that I thought was also interesting is that her quick start fell to a one. And the only thing I can attribute this to, and this is just me, this is my opinion, is that she now has kids. So when she took it in 2007, she didn't have any kids. She probably was before she bought her first house, you know, so she actually became less of a risk taker as her responsibilities in her life grew. Now, in my case, I don't remember what my quick start was back in 2007, and I don't have a copy of those results that I can find easily. So, but I'm guessing that my quick start maintained. I think even in, in that process, I had a, a child by the time, so Sam was born in 2002, and so she was five when I took the test. And so I think mine, if I had taken it prior to having kids, I maybe, maybe I, it would have been lower than, and you would have seen an increase. But I think it's really important to note that, you know, over those years, so 14 years between the time she took it, there wasn't a lot of change. And so this assessment tells me that it's very accurate for what, like it promotes is what is your natural problem solving go-to? Where do you go to in your brain for that? You know, and so Nicole falls to that fact finder and follow through, which is very typical inside of the accounting profession and with low risk. You know, she's not a big risk taker. And I think that is really interesting because she's really good at what she does. And that tells me that I want more people that have those types of skills because that means they're going to be really good at the work that gets assigned to them. So for me, you know, I'm the entrepreneur accountant. And the fact that I'm high in fact finding, that makes sense because there is something to be said that accountants are looking for information and I'm high in quick start. And so what this boils down to is that I pretty much attack problems by brainstorming first and then researching. I don't research first. I do, I brainstorm for sure. And I want the bottom line and I want to know what's next without sifting through all the details. That's my quick start. That's my just move forward. Just give me the facts, please. Just the bottom line. And my other, I won't call it a problem, but I am low in follow through, which is not typical of the industry. 
And I am more of a person who is looking to see how can a process fit into the existing system of what we're doing. And I'm not going to be the first person to say, yeah, let me create a new system. So because of that lower follow through number, I tend to um, be slow to create processes. And let me tell you, that has had an impact over the years in being able to actually get some systems, repeatable systems set up. Because like I said, I can I have the idea, but I don't necessarily have the time or the desire to actually set up the system to make it happen. And it has, it stalled me over the years. I guarantee it. It was one of those things that it fell on my shoulders to make those systems at the time. And until I recognized the fact that that's not my strong suit and I need to hire people onto my team that can help me get better at that or get it done, or I can have the idea and we can brainstorm how we think it should work, but somebody else is putting it in place and having me test it. And then we can sort out what's next and what it looks like. And one of those things that I fell into was a kind of a, a, it wasn't good, was having a workflow system. So using some sort of engagement software. Now, when I came into the firm, after I, I left a firm and I was starting fresh and had, you know, was getting my own software and doing things and nobody at the time had any knowledge of an engagement software. And this was something that I had been used to over the years that every firm I'd ever worked in had somebody managing managing the due date list. And when I, in 2007, eight, nine, when I kind of went out on my own to begin with, and I partnered up with somebody who had a bookkeeping firm and they used a process that was not a typical public accounting type of software. And I struggled for years in finding a way to keep track of the due dates. We used some sort of CRM once and we used Outlook once and we Excel spreadsheets for sure. And I did not bite the bullet and actually get an engagement software. And when I did, it was 2011. And boy, it was an implementation that it felt like it took forever. It wasn't great. It was server-based. So if the server crashed, we kind of couldn't figure out what we were doing ever to know what was still due. And I was really looking for a cloud-based solution, but it took me so long to finally make the change because it would be a whole new system and it would need some love and attention and it would need to be thought through and have some touch points and have some deadlines. And, and I'm great with tax deadlines, but when it comes to setting up a system, I was just overwhelmed by it. And in 2019, I believe, is when we finally went to Jetpack Workflow. And that was a cloud-based system. And again, I was overwhelmed. And there was someone on my team who I had just hired and said, this is what I need you to do. I need you to get this system created. And she could do it. And she did it. And we're still using it to this day. And it's since then, we've had additional hires who have been great process people and have kept this going. But oh my gosh, de delays for me trying to get the system set up was, it hurt the business for sure. We hurt by not just having something in place to manage all of that, that made sense for the business and that someone could set up and completely define everything and teach me how to use it essentially. And it worked and, and it wasn't without my input. I'm not, I don't want to make you think that I don't know how to solve these types of problems. I do say I probably get bored. I get impatient. I want it to just work without a lot of input from me. So yeah, those are some things that I do recognize in myself. But more importantly, when I look at my the rest of my team, so here's some results. So we have a another member. He's a seven on fact finder, an eight on follow through, 
101 on Quick Start. And we're not going to talk about Implementer because really that doesn't apply too much for us. So seven, eight, and a one. And then we have another one, another team member. She's a seven on Fact Finder, seven on Follow Through, two on Quick Start. Are you seeing a pattern here? Like I said, I love this team that I have right now. They are rock stars, you know? So I have another one. Here's another one. An eight, eight, two. So lots of fact finding, lots of follow through, not a lot of risk. And I think I've got one more. And she was a six, eight on follow through, a six on fact finder, eight on follow through, two on quick start. So this is telling me I found the people. I did not give this assessment to anyone prior to me hiring them. This was after they had been with me, some, you know, like from the beginning, some for a number of years. And this is what it's telling me. And I decided that this is something that I will be doing as we add to the team, you know, and it's not necessarily to say, I'm not going to hire you if you don't test high in these, but it is going to be one of those tools that helps us determine how best to work and communicate with people. So I find it really important to have this type of tool in order to help you figure out who needs to be on your team. I would definitely use it in the hiring process. It tests your instincts and your natural tendencies. And so that doesn't necessarily change how someone's going to think, which means you can't, can't train these tendencies is what I guess I'm trying to say. So, you know, this is their natural tendency. And so if I were to have a score from someone that I was considering hiring and either they were just like me, where they were low on follow through and high on quick start, I would be a little concerned that they really do want to go do this on their own. They want to be an entrepreneur. Although if I were ever to have another partner, that that might be a good a good candidate to have. But right now, I need people who complement where I am not as strong. And so I have surrounded myself with a team of people who are definitely keeping me on track because they are so much better at some of these things than I am. And recognizing and seeing in this colored graph that oh, this is why, this is why, because my tendency is to be a quick start and not follow through. And that's very important to know. Now, I will tell you that another area that it can be accurate is when someone is in a state of transition. Maybe they're not sure what's going on in their life. Maybe they're doing a career change. Maybe they just aren't sure. That can also be detected on this test. And I did a, a hire a couple years ago where it was someone who I needed somebody kind of in a hurry. And she had just retired at the end of the year. And she didn't really love being retired yet. And so she thought, well, you know what, I think maybe I want to go back to work and I'll work for somebody. But it was within a few months of her having retired. So, and I gave her the assessment and the result from Col the, her Colby analysis was that she was in a state of transition. And what that meant was all of her action modes, her fact finder, her follow through, her quick start and her implementer were all very similar in level. There wasn't anything that stood out. And what that meant was that she was in a state of transition. So, everything was sort of middle of the road and nothing stood out. And that, when I did the research for talking about this today, I realized that was a sign that she was just in her life. She was in some sort of, of a transitional state. So when she took that assessment, she didn't have anything that really said, yeah, this is how I always am. And this is, and so when she, you know, did these, these they're multiple choice questions. It just, she came across very even. And when that happens, until you're settled, if you were to retake it after you were settled, 
you it your true tendencies would probably come through. She was had retired and that was a big deal and now now she's like, well maybe I don't want to be retired and maybe I want to do this or maybe I want to do that. And I think that uncertainty absolutely showed through on the test and in fact it showed through in how she worked on the team as well. And so we I didn't have overly detailed communication from her, which I would have preferred than to have more than not enough. I didn't have a lot of follow through on processes. Yeah, it was just one of those things that now I look back on it and say, wow, that test really did tell me something. I just was not in a position to pay attention to it. So really, I think if you put any type of a assessment or quote unquote personality test inside of your hiring process, it can give you a lot of insight into what people can do. So I've used the Colby A assessment. I've used the Synergist test, which is done by Les McEwen, who that tests whether someone is a, a visionary operator processor or Synergist. He's got a couple of books about about from Synergist. So his name is Les McEwen. I'll put the information about him in the show notes as well as a link to the Colby A site. Like I said, I am not an affiliate of any of these people, but I think just having the information is could be super valuable to you. The other test that I use is the DISC assessment. And I've used that when that pretty much gives you some, again, number related or letters as far as giving you, you know, are people more feeling or more analytical? Are they more dominant? Are they more, and that is a pretty telling test. There's a a book I've read about kind of defining and understanding people's disk results that I've used. And so I will list that as well. So the show notes are going to be at accountingwithconfidence.com slash blog, and it will be episode six. And there you will be able to find anything relating to the Colby A index that I've talked about here. I'll put a link here for the Les McEwen and the disk. And then also I'm going to include a place where you can submit a question. If you have any questions relating to this topic or anything in the process of owning and running an accounting or bookkeeping office that you love, and you would like some help or support on any type of question, I will leave a link there where you can ask a question so that I can put together a listener questions episode in the future. Okay, everybody, that is all I have. I hope everybody has a great week. And if you need me, you know where to find me. Thanks for listening. I always end my weekly team meetings with have a great week. If you need me, you know where to find me. And I realized I said that. And with this whole podcasting thing, it's new and you may not know where to find me. Go to accountingwithconfidence.com and while you're there, sign up for six easy ways to reclaim time in your accounting firm and that will keep us connected. Have a great week.